Amen. Well, we've had a series recently on giving, and I wanted to share with you the massive impact I really feel that that series has had on me personally, and I know also on some of you as well from conversations that I've had. And I want to share some incredible thinking and experiences that I've had over the last month or so where I've allowed God to take more control over my money rather than me being in control of it. Um, And it's fair to say that one of the things I realised was that I've spent a lot of my time in my life working for money. And now I want to make a shift into working for the joy of the Lord and seeing what he can do with the money because I think he's going to do a much better job than I've done. And so I wanted to share with you the journey that I've been on and some of it may resonate with you and I hope it does. And uh, let's just see where it takes us. You see, in my lifetime, I've known what it's like to be really poor and I've known what it's like to have perhaps a bit more than I need. The last time I was really poor was Christmas 2010 when my daughters were aged 12 and 14 and they came to stay with me for the Christmas weekend. I could only just scrape enough money that week for the rent for where I was staying. And all I was left with was these coins in a jar. Now it was a big jar, one of those big sweetie jars, if you can picture it. And it was about three quarters full. And we emptied it all out onto the carpet. We counted it all up and bagged it all up and it came to 72 pounds. And that 72 pounds was enough to buy food for the weekend, video rentals from Blockbusters, those of you who remember the Blockbusters days, and their Christmas presents. After that, I was completely broke. And what I then learned as a non-Christian was that there is a world system for attracting and acquiring money. I read books like Think and Grow Rich and The Master Key System. And I applied these books to the letter and began to experience financial success. Things started turning round. You see, I believe with God there's a formula for everything, like there is with gravity and, and DNA, and there's a formula for nearly everything. And, um, There is a formula to acquire riches. And you don't need to be a Christian to apply this formula because like all of God's formulas, they're indiscriminate. They apply to the world. It's this formula that the world has grasped and it drives worldly wealth. But it drives that wealth in a way where there's a total imbalance. And wealth is created for the few at the expense of extreme poverty for the many. I've also learned that money is a hard taskmaster and you have to work very hard to get it. Wouldn't you agree? (laughs) Haven't you had to work hard? But working hard for money has made me want to keep it. And there's the rub. You start trusting more in money than in God. Let's take a look at Luke 16. Before we, before, oh, it's coming up, so that's good. I've never understood this parable, and I still struggle with it a little bit now. Jesus has told this parable to his disciples in private. After the parable of the lost coin and the prodigal son, Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the shrewd manager. And what's so interesting is, Why is Jesus calling him a shrewd manager when actually he's a crook? And I was thinking, I don't understand this. But it's about perspective. So let's have a look. Luke 16, verse 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be the manager anymore. 
The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it out for 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master, despite being ripped off, the master commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly in accordance with the worldly wisdom of how we manage money. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind and their own finances than they are the people of light. And this, that really opened my eyes to think, I have to manage things differently because I'm a people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one, love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The manager's commended because he recognises that there is a world system for accumulating riches, but the danger with the world system is it deceives us into loving money more than loving God. And as children of light, we're here to love God. And we love God first, yeah? So Jesus goes on in Luke 16 to tell the story of the rich man who ignored the beggar and the beggar then died and the angels took him up to Abraham's side in heaven. When the rich man died, he ended up in hell having ignored the plight of the beggar while he was here on earth. So alongside the world's formula for loving money, I believe God has a formula for accumulating heavenly riches as well as earthly ones. And that's the journey I've been on. And I wanted to share what I believe, well, what I believe. <laughs> um, and so there are five elements to God's worldly wealth and heavenly wealth formula that I wanted to share with you. Like our hand is five, okay? Number one is the blessing of God that is released through the tithe. Did you know that ten, less than 10% of Christians worldwide make the tithe? And they wonder why God sometimes takes a bit longer to answer our prayers. There is the tithe, which is the amount of 10%, but then there is tithing. So what's tithing? Tithing is the manner in which we bring the tithe. Tithing is an act of worship and obedience. It shows how serious we are about trusting God. Deuteronomy 26 even tells us what we should say when we bring the tithe into God's storehouse. Perhaps we could have a quick look at Deuteronomy 26. When you have come into the land which, was the Lord your, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance and possess it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the soil which you harvest from the land and the Lord your God gives you and put it in a basket 
and go to a place which the Lord your God has chosen as the abiding place for his name and his presence. And you should go to the priest who is in office in those days and say to him, I give thanks this day to the Lord your God that I have come to the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall say before the Lord your God, a wandering and lost Aramean ready to perish was my father Jacob. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and he became there a great nation, great, mighty and numerous. And the Egyptians treated us very badly and afflicted us and laid, us, laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried to the Lord, the Lord our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labour and our cruel oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great awesome power and with signs and with wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I bring the first fruits of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship. I'm going to stop there. Because it's the worship when we give. That giving to the Lord, in whichever way we do it, whichever is on our heart to do, it's an act of worship. And that's what I'm learning more and more. And the tithing and the way we tithe is like a circumcision of our money in the same way that we have a circumcision of our heart from all the bad stuff. It's the recognition that everything I have comes from God. Philippians verse four, cha uh, sorry, chapter four, verse 19 says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. So Deuteronomy talks about the law, but we know in Jesus we have the grace and it's through the grace that we come and we worship and we know that he gave everything for us, everything. And why tithing is important, it's because it's an acknowledgement of Jesus, our Lord. And it's also an expression of our fear of the Lord. So if we walk in the fear of the Lord, will experience more of what the early, ch the early church did, which we're desperate to experience. In Acts 9, verse 31, it says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and were strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. See, if we don't walk in the fear of the Lord, then we often find ourselves walking in the fear of man. We become very self-conscious, small thinking, maybe poverty or lack-minded. And we hold back from God sometimes, and it keeps us from entering into the real abundance that God has there for us. Tithing is rooted in the word of God from Genesis 1. It leads to obedience, humility, and a lifetime of living in God's way. God created the tithe principle to help us fully understand that he has given everything. Everything comes from him. I believe that tithing is the proof that the fear of the Lord is active and working in my life. Some people say, well, I give as the spirit, spirit leads me. Really? Tithing the first fruits is obedience to God's word, the Logos. Offerings can be obedience to the Holy Spirit, the Rhema. And we touched upon the Logos and the Rhema in our series. 
You know, Jesus gave everything, but society today says, hang on to what you've got. You might need it for a rainy day. Accumulate. Keep up with the Joneses. Jesus says, you're mine. Follow me. When Jesus came, he didn't replace the law. He came to fulfill it and ask us to follow him. This means that if my life truly is no longer my own, then it has to be God's way. And he never changes. And that can be a hard thing. Yeah? Obedience to God can sometimes be a hard road. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In Malachi 3, 6 to 10, it says, uh, here we go, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how do we return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. It really hit me when God said, test me in this. Doesn't Jesus say in response to the devil in the wilderness, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to test. And yet it seems that we can test God on one thing, our giving. And the verse from Malachi is not a promise, it's a prophecy. If we give, God will release the storehouses of heaven. So finally on tithing, I'd like to add that to properly tithe, it must go into God's storehouse. So I decided to put God to the test. And since I've put God to the test with tithing, I've seen some incredible, incredible results. And what I've learned since has really opened my eyes. You see, tithing is like the greenhouse. The tithe builds the greenhouse. And in a greenhouse, you have all the right conditions for growth. Yeah? You have good, good planters, good soil. You might have a fully operational hydroponic system. But you have the perfect environment for growth. But if you don't have seed... What good is a greenhouse on its own? So in addition to tithing, we need number two, sowing. We need to be sowing as well as tithing. When you sow, you make additional offerings. And now these might be of your time, your money, your possessions, but those offerings in sowing, are sowing to further the kingdom of God. That's not giving. It's sowing. There's a huge difference between the two, as I've learned, and I've learned that number three is giving. So sowing, sowing is different. It's investing in the expansion of the kingdom of God. When a farmer sows, he doesn't just walk away. He sows, next morning he checks that the birds haven't taken everything. He checks the seed, he protects it, he nurtures it, he goes back, he waters it, he supports its growth, he feeds it, he sees it develop. And just at the right time, he might even see a great harvest. 
When we sow into God's kingdom, we are like the farmer. Maybe we sow into Christian aid, for example, or helping a local family. We don't just support them financially. We're interested in their progress. We often support them with words of encouragement or prophecy. We might pray for healing for them. We are wanting to share their progress with others and we're wanting to see that the Lord is blessing them. So we want to know when we sow that we are seeing a return on that investment, yeah? Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6 says, Sow your seed in the morning and at evening let your hands not be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally as well. When we're sowing, we're active. We're making sure that that is that giving is producing fruit, and that's the sowing element of it. God loves it. He absolutely loves it when we sow into things. He sees the generosity of our heart, and He sees us aligned to His heart because He's a generous, loving God. We become more like the servant with the ten talents, investing in what he's given us, and so much more will be returned. We just cannot imagine. And we're investing in the storehouses of heaven and the treasures of heaven. Tithing honours God, but sowing builds our faith. Galatians 6, verses 8 to 10. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest uh, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to to the family of believers. Wow. Wow. What is sowing? I believe Jesus makes it very clear when he tells us in Matthew 25, verse 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Amen. Amen. So that leads me into giving, number three. How is this different to sowing? Well, giving is just giving. (laughs) It's where we feel compelled, either secretly, not letting our left hand know what our right hand is doing, or prompting of the Holy Spirit to give to meet a specific need. But often we would give and just walk away. That's not sowing. That's giving. We may never know the outcome of that giving, but we give nonetheless because we know Jesus gave us everything. Sometimes when we we give when we didn't plan to give. Ever been in that situation? And sometimes we give when we don't really even want to give. (laughs) Been in that situation. Luke 6.30 says, this really knocked me over. Give to everyone who asks you. Wow. 
And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't even ask for it back. (laughs) Do to others as you would have them do to you. Wow. When we give unconditionally, without any desire for praise, in a way that only our Father sees, especially to the poor, we are delighting him. And when the time comes, he, yes, God himself, will shout from the rooftops your name and the delight that he has in you for what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This leads me into number four. Lending. Lending. Luke 6, verse 34 to 35 says, And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. I needed a bit more encouragement on lending after reading that one. So I found Psalm 15. And in Psalm 15 it says, the Psalm of David, it says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour, who casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts. And does not change their mind. And remembers to buy the coffee. (laughs) Who lends money to the poor without interest. Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Come on Lord. Wow. The power of lending. And I must emphasise if you're going to lend... Do be led by the Holy Spirit on this one. But to lend and not charge interest to a fellow brother and sister in Christ when they need it the most is a huge blessing both to them and to God. It can be the fuel for the furtherance of God's kingdom. With lending as opposed to giving, there's self-esteem. See, inwardly people don't like to see themselves as a charity case they might not want to give they might not want you to give money to them they might feel embarrassed but they might but they need the money and they might prefer to be able to repay it many poor people today are getting caught in this horrible payday loans trap of crippling interest rates and credit cards with APRs at 46% It leads them spiralling down into greater levels of poverty. Oh Lord, if only the church could rise up and help people in such a way by lending to them, helping them maintain their self-esteem and providing them with interest-free loans and all at the same time not worrying if it ever gets paid back because we can trust in you, Lord. This would be such a blessing, it would open the storehouses of heaven. Lord, thank you. Number five is the last one, you'll be pleased to know, and then we're going to worship the Lord our God again. Number five is work. If we don't work, numbers one, two, three, and four don't really work. God does not want us to be idle. He encourages us to work. In Ephesians 4, verse 28, it says, Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, 
that they may have something to share with those in need. Working that they may have something to share with those in need. Wow. The real question here is on what basis are we working? Are we working for money or are we working for Jesus? And I was working for money. So I've decided, and I declare here and now, I've decided to fire money as my boss. <laughs> money, you are sacked. I will never work for you again. Instead, I'm going to work for joy. I am going to work for the joy of the Lord. And to help me, money, I hire you. You work for me from now on. I watched this wonderful video interview of Duncan and Kate Smith, pastors in, in Canada, and they painted this lovely image that money is your army. You are general in the Lord's army. If you have 10 pounds, you have 10 soldiers. Take the first soldier and return him to the Lord. <laughs> Say to the next soldier, return back to me with 10 more soldiers. That might be in our sowing. You might give or lend one soldier to someone else and the remaining soldiers are perhaps left to meet your needs. Before long, you will have a heavenly host of soldiers at your disposal. To illustrate as best I can, I wanted to share this little story with you. And those of you that might be following the uh, Bible app with um, Nikki Gumbel will recognize this story. And it's quite emotional, so you know what I'm like. I'll end up going. Um, Hattie Mae Wyatt, a six-year-old girl, lived near Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia. The Sunday school was really packed. Russell Conwell, the minister, told her that one day they would have buildings big enough to fit everybody in. She said, I hope you will. It's so crowded, I'm afraid to go alone. He replied, when we get the money, we will construct one large enough to get all the children in. Two years later, in 1886, little Hattie May, aged eight, died. After the funeral, Hattie's mother gave the minister a little bag. This little bag had been found under the daughter's pillow. It contained 57 pennies in change that she had saved up. Alongside it was a note in her handwriting to help build bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. Wow, 57 pence. The minister put each of the 57 pennies up for sale and raised 250 pounds. The 250 pounds was then changed into pennies and all of those pennies were sold. 26 years later, in a talk entitled The History of the 57 Pennies, the minister explained the results of Hattie's donation. A church with a membership of over 5,000 people, where tens of thousands of young people were going through university, 80,000 people in total, where 2,000 were going out on the streets to preach the gospel, where tens of thousands of people had been treated in the hospital they also built alongside the Sunday school. All this happened because Hattie Mae Wyatt invested her 57 pennies. The theme of multiplication runs throughout the Bible. Whatever you decide to tithe, sow, give or lend with the right heart, God will multiply it. What can't be achieved through addition 
God will do through multiplication. But you can't multiply anything from zero. Zero times a billion is zero. You reap what you sow, only many times more. Whatever you give to the Lord, he multiplies. And I just thought that story was so wonderful. And you know, I've spoken to a lot of you since, and there's some amazing stories. One person sold their house. God said, give the, give the sale proceeds to the church. Can you imagine if God said that to you? And so she did. And when she handed it over to the church, the vicar said, is that all? I was expecting more. That's, that's all. That's every penny. But it, it went into the church. So sometimes it's, it's given with a beautiful heart and not received with a beautiful heart. Stay in the Lord. So she stayed in the Lord and trusted the Lord. And he said, in five years' time, you'll have another house and you'll be mortgage-free. How's that going to work? But it has. And she now lives in a house that's mortgage-free. God is good. And so just to close, I wanted to share this little story with you that happened to me personally. And to illustrate as best I can how I've tried to apply this thinking. And then I'd love us to come back and worship the Lord because the Lord is so good in our lives. So last week was Yitka's final week at school. <laughs> and it was sports day followed by the school fate. She asked me to go, but I was busy, as I am always busy. <laughs> and as it drew near the time of the fate, I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to go. I actually thought I heard him say, test me on this. So I went. But when I got there, it was the fate was going on in full swing. And I realised I only had five soldiers in my pocket. I gave one soldier to the tombola. I gave two to the raffle. I gave one soldier to guess the weight of the cake. Oh, the most beautiful cake you've ever seen. And I gave one to Yitka, who was serving up strawberries and cream. There was my little uh, guilty pleasure. What happened next was incredible. Because when I gave the one to the tombola, you take five little tickets out, yeah, and there's all these wonderful little prizes, and if you've got a ticket with a zero, you've won one of the prizes. I've only got three zeros out of my five. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I thought, oh, wow. And then I thought, no, no, no. no these prizes are not for me. So I gave them back, and I said, take these back for other people to win. Really? Oh, that's so lovely of you. So generous. Thank you. Then I went to the raffle. I bought two raffle strips and I met Cara, who we've all prayed about, this lovely little girl that Yik has been working with all year and suffers with autism. She's, you know, she's like this. She can't stay still for a minute. She's a beautiful, beautiful little girl. And in the, in the drawer for the raffle, they had 10 prizes. And these prizes had been given by local businesses, so they, they were good prizes, you know. And one of them, the third, the third prize, was this chocolate mountain of sweet. Every chocolate bar you can think of in this huge, it was bigger than Cara. She was stood in front of me, and they call out, Oh, and it's the chocolate mountain is blue 418. Oh, I've got blue 418. What are the chances? So I tapped Cara on the shoulder and I said, Cara, look, I think that's the winning ticket. You go and take it up there. She was like, ah. And it made her year. She's leaping around with the chocolate mountain. And it made her year. And... It gave me such joy. And then I went to weigh the cake. So I thought, well, I'm, 
I'm going to go for 1,450 grams. Got to be. Spot on. It's got to be. And then this other little girl came up. I can't remember her name, Yitka. Edie. Bless her heart. And I was speaking to the other teacher, Matt, and he said, the reason why I gave up my job earning all my money as a pharmaceutical chemist is because I love teaching these little ones. And as he said it, he tapped her on the head. And I just felt like God was tapping her on the head. And so and she had the last guess for the cake and she said, it's a pound. He said, no, it's more than a pound, Edie. It's more than a, it weighs more than a pound. No, she goes, no, it's a pound. And she guessed a pound. How heavy was the cake? 1,440 grams. I got it exact. And he's going, Mr. Teague's won the cake. And I'm going, no, 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 no. It's only a pound. He goes, what? I said, it's only a pound. He goes, oh, Edie's won the cake. And it made Edie's year because her eyes were like, <laughs> when she saw the cake. And I just felt this was God saying to me, you can't outgive me. Keep going, do another one. You can't outgive me because I will give you back. So I'm driving home in the car, and Nika phones me and she says, you didn't buy an orange strip, did you? I said, yeah, yeah, I did. Please tell me you haven't got 515. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got 515. <laughs> it's only the first price. A weekend away in a nice hotel. And I'm like, I can't turn around and give that back now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Of course, the key thing for us to understand about giving, whichever area it falls in, is that we all live by God's grace. Yeah? Not by the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law for us. So it's through our faith in Christ that we step out. Thank you, Lord. It means that when, not if, we tithe. We tithe to obey God's law. But we tithe, we don't tithe to obey the law, but we tithe in response to the revelation that Jesus loves every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Our overall giving honours God, but he honours us. Thank you, Lord. Let's come to the Lord and worship him because we know whatever we give, we cannot outgive God. He will always outgive you. Amen. <laughs>